Dr. Collins is talking about, but I think the changes I'm going to be talking about, I think, are at the core of what might help get more rare diseases treated. Now, there have been a number of successes, no doubt, in, uh, in drug development, so we have to recognize that the companies working with FDA have had a number of diseases treated that have never been treated before in the last few years, so it's been quite successful. But we also have to recognize that there are a number of challenges, and those diseases, just a few of them listed here, some of them could be treated, but because they're either more rare or they don't have appropriate surrogate endpoints or very difficult, what I call in inconvenient biology, they affect the connective tissues like bone and things that are very hard to treat. Some of these won't get treatments, even though some of them have technology that exists, it's already NIH funded, completed, that could be put into use, but they won't make it. And so I want to highlight what I think are the three areas of most concern, and I will take you through our own Alderazyme experience as jumping off points to why I think these are the areas of, that we could improve things. We heard a little bit earlier about the accelerated approval regulations. This is where you use a, a blood or urine test, for example, as one possible way of testing whether a drug's working. And those regulations are, I think, were extremely important in getting AHIV drugs through the process and have been very successful. However, for rare diseases, it's very difficult to use these regulations because there's not a lot of clinical experience that is usually needed to validate or, or at least support the use of the surrogate. I'll talk more about that example later. The traditional study designs and analysis that are used, the double blind placebo control studies, traditionally are, is the gold standard, right? But the gold turns to lead uh, sometimes for rare diseases because there's so much baseline heterogeneity that the disease treatment effects are very hard to discern and very difficult to manage. And I think we need to look at that issue as well, how to design studies for very heterogeneous, complex, multi-system diseases. I think there's also insufficient expertise, both FDA and industry, and I think there are certainly a group at FDA that's been working the last few years and gaining experience and working very hard as, you know, and with some success, but I think that in fact there is substantially more expertise that could be brought to bear in organizational change that might improve, and I'll talk about these now in a little bit more detail. Now, the jumping off point here is the, well, So, is aldurazyme, this is a project I started in academia, and it's an enzyme replacement therapy for a disease called MPS1, or mucopolysaccharidosis. We'll, we'll call it MPS1 for here. It, this is a, a severe hurler patient and a mild patient. These patients both have the same enzyme deficiency, even though they're quite different from each other. We developed an enzyme therapy in dogs. I won't go through it, but we're able to show we can treat the dogs effectively. And we began uh, with a small startup company. I was able to get the project uh, to enter the clinic. And we visited FDA and CBER at that time and, and worked together and came up with an open label study in 10 patients to get approval. And we were going to use surrogate measures of storage. This, these patients build up material in their body, and we're going to measure whether that build up goes down. It was very similar to what was done for Saturdays for Gaucher, another lysosomal storage disorder. And we proceeded ahead, uh, and we were following the, the model here of, uh, you know, from Brady's work and the Bartner publication on how they got Saturdays approved. Now, we did the study that we planned, and we showed the storage in the liver went down, and the storage in the urine uh, decreased, and we even had some clinical endpoints successful. And these were very statistically persuasive results, so both surrogate and clinical endpoints improved, and I certainly was extremely excited because uh, I set my whole career to treat one disease, and we seem to have gotten there very quickly. We published this work in the New England Journal of Medicine, which, of course, is a great thrill for any academic investigator. This is me with a group of patients, and I want to point out to you that this girl here has MPS1, and this young lady here, 17 years old, also has MPS1, just to give you an idea of the breadth of variation. Now, we were very happy with what happened, and at this point, the FDA asked us a question, which is, well, what does the liver size and urine test really mean? That is, does it predict clinical benefit? Can you show us that it predicts clinical benefit? Now, this is a normal question, and I think it's normal because when you're using surrogates, you need to be able to show that they relate to something clinically important. And so it is a normal question, although it did come after the positive study that we had designed, and it did uh, involve different uh, reviewers at FDA. Now, what we could show them is we had excellent canine data. We could show them the science behind this, the fact that these patients were missing an enzyme, the material accumulated, we reduced that material, 
we showed how that worked with the dog. But we were lacking independent human data. And so without that data, the surrogates were discarded. And if you can imagine how many rare diseases actually have previous human clinical data from trials? Well, none, very commonly. And so you end up basically <coughs> unable to, to meet that standard. And so once, once that was gone, you see then the study was open label because it was based on using objective primary endpoints. And therefore the clinical data couldn't be relied upon in, in their view, which is understandable, although I think things like sleep apnea and growth rate were objective enough. But in any case, we got we were basically uh, delayed at that point. I don't seem to be okay. Uh, we were delayed, and we needed to design a phase three study. So we designed a phase three randomized control trial, double blind trial. Actually, David Meeker sitting in front was with me in the room as we were trying to design the study. And what we ended up doing was picking two endpoints for which had never been studied in MPS patients ever before, but they were ones that were relevant for other drug approvals. And we conducted a phase three study having no idea what the treatment effect was going to be. And we selected force vital capacity or how well the patients breathe and how well they walk, a six minute walk test. Now we selected for patients that had abnormal breathing, but we couldn't select for both things because we wouldn't have any patients that had everything. And so we selected only for the breathing problem, not the walk problem. When we did the study, we had a very good result with the statistical significance with the breathing problem problem, which was improved. Uh, the walking, though, we, we just missed. But the problem here was that we had, in this study, patients walking from, from 10 meters to 500 meters in the same study, which is 10 times the size of what is considered a clinically meaningful change of 50 meters. That's the baseline variation, 10 times what is a reasonable effect. So that is extremely hard to manage. Now, if you use alternative analyses using covariables, or repeated measures, other types of statistical tests, you could get statistical significance, but that wasn't allowed. And so we were stuck at that point. So um, what we ended up having to do was additional, uh, additional work on extension data, and we ended up, of course, delayed again. Now, so what ended up happening in the program was the surrogates got rejected, and we had to do this study, and then we needed extension data after the phase three study. Eventually, we reached advisory committee, and then approval in 2003. But the total path here was took a three-year delay from what we were intending. Now, the real impact, of course, was patients who were uh, with MPS-1 during the process that did die waiting for fast use, and it was very difficult for me because I get the calls and the urgent crises that occur, and certainly a burden I still carry because it's not a simple process when you're dying from MPS-1. <coughs> the MPS-7 program, which I've gotten the company to consider as sort of a charitable venture, was eliminated because we couldn't predict that we were going to be able to do this on one study as the MPS-1 program. And the 4A program, which is another bone type, a bone cartilage type MPS disease, uh, fell off the radar then, then got canceled because we couldn't predict whether we would be able to use a surrogate and environment, of course, nearly failed. We nearly ran out of cash at least a couple times during this period. Now, we did survive and eventually developed three, three approved products. But these are the real costs of what happens when you get hung up in this situation. So, I want to talk a little about MPS-7, the study that uh, uh, we weren't able to do. This is a very rare disease, and this is a child, uh, Matthew, who's, who's now uh, seven years old. But he was born 10 years after the disease itself, MPS-7, was successfully treated. And this kid still lives in a hospital in the Queens and hasn't been treated. And I will tell you very honestly, this disease will never be treated in the current situation. And so if you want to treat these really rare diseases where we have the technology, you need to do something different. Ian Michael Smith, another child who I think you should be familiar with. And Ian is a uh, young man with Morpheus syndrome. And he was famous for his uh, portrayal of Simon Birch in the movie Simon Birch. And in that movie, he, uh, his uh, defects were part of why he was searching for his purpose in life, which a lot of genetic patients do. Here he is now, he's graduating from MIT with a degree in computer sciences. And he's uh, using a scooter, and he has the physical uh, problems that relate to Morpheus syndrome. But what you didn't know is that, see, it's at that time, as I just told you, we had a program, and he visited us if we were trying to work on Morpheus syndrome, 
But as it got canceled, and now many years later, of course, no treatment, and I struggled over the few years to try to figure out a way to move forward, I was able to get the program reinitiated at Biomarin, and now in April we just treated the first patient in the study, coming back again. But it's only because we think now that we can get some treatment that will be measurable clinically using the walk test or the breathing. But if that doesn't happen, then we will have a problem, and uh, that may put this program more at risk. But we think right now that there will be substantial benefit in these other areas. But this is obviously another case that is very difficult. So what I want to very quickly go through is the fact that surrogates are very hard to use. You have a defect, we know what accumulates to treat a model, and, but we can't get to here because in order to do the clinical study and get validation, you have to do many clinical studies. It's a very difficult, long process to get to something that's validated approval and approval based on the surrogate. Now, so that process is never going to happen in some of the rare diseases. But what does happen is another process which is somewhat unpredictable in which we can negotiate and use data and get through. But the truth is that this is a very difficult path. Favrazon got approved in this, but very difficult coming down to an advisory committee meeting off all the investment in. Kuban, which I was involved with, got approved, but there was a lot of data on PKU. But for a lot of disease, that data doesn't exist and this path doesn't happen. And what really happens is it stopped right here because this project never gets into the company, into the company thinks you're never going to get through, and I'm not going to negotiate through whether that might, that rare disease might actually make it, so it gets stopped right there. So we need a practical way forward for accelerated approvals on qualified surrogates. I don't want bad signs, I want good signs. We need to figure out how to do it without having to have clinical proof ahead of time. And I think there's a good way to figure that through, and I think we can work on that. Good science needs to count, and I will, because of time, I'll move ahead, but I think we need to figure out how to get qualified surrogate endpoints, and these qualified, not validated qualified, are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, we think, if we can set those criteria of what those would be. By creating that clarity in regulations or guidances, down, you know, at venture capitalist uh, offices where someone's trying to pitch a project, it could get started again, and we'll start getting investment to occur. I think we need to look at study designs and, and really figure out how to deal with the heterogeneity and dealing with a variety of patients. And I think we should look at some kind of all-comer designs, and there were some other discussions of alternative study designs. I think we need to look at that, either create the guidances or other things that are set, not as a negotiation one by one, but rather something that we agree up front is a reasonable thing for some of these rare diseases. And this is not to create uh, appearance of efficacy where there is none. This is to capture the efficacy that really is there. And we need to be able to map, evaluate multiple endpoints, which is not done today. We need to analyze <coughs> endpoints in patients who have the problem at baseline, be able to exclude patients who don't have the problem, as we had with our six-minute walk test results, where if we had just gotten rid of some of the patients who walk normally at baseline, we had an excellent result. So we need more sophistication also in how we analyze these data. So I think we need to look at that and figure out how to create a guidance that would improve study design statistics. Oops, now we can point up. I set up a found, left by our Miranda, I set up a foundation. We're setting these to cure the process campaigns to try to fix these areas. And I think uh, we want to work with all of you, with FDA and everyone, to figure out how to make improvements in the process that will allow us to move forward. And I, I want to point out to you that while there's a lot of success, and we could be complacent, you know, I, I look back at the story with the, in the Titanic when people were sitting in their boats and they were singing so they didn't have to hear the people who were drowning. Well, there are patients out there with genetic diseases who are the same as drowning in the full dark Atlantic. And we could say, well, we want, we want everything to be the same, but I think what we need is smart. We need the regulation to be smart and pick and do the right thing for those patients and not be worry about the risk to us and our situation, status quo, we need to go back and start figuring out ways to catch some more of these patients and take a certain amount of risk, that smart risk, and to move forward. So I'll be spending the year working on this, uh, assembling a scientific committee and focusing on creating the right kind of scientifically sound changes and proposing those uh, for improving the process and getting more rare diseases treated. Thank you.